G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy Podcast for yet another episode throughout this long off season. Today we are doing the New Year's Podcast, so uh, by the time you're watching this, it's already 2024. Uh, as it currently stands right now, it is about 4 o'clock on New Year's Eve here in the UK. And I thought, much like the Christmas Day podcast, I'd do another one for New Year's Eve, um, because why not? Now, you're probably thinking, uh, look, 4 o'clock on New Year's Eve, Jesse's probably uh, bracing himself for a big night out tonight. The answer is no, and I wish you could say, because so, I'm so disciplined, and uh, that I want to get up early and work tomorrow. That is kind of true. But the truth is, I'm actually really hungover, because we decided to go out last night instead. Um, so I've got a bit of a ha- uh, hangover, a bit of a headache today, uh, but I thought I'd fire up a potty with you all because these kinds of podcasts are fun. I did a uh, post in the community tab of this channel and uh, a few people wrote some questions, which is great. So we got a mixture of non-football stuff and then towards the back end, we'll talk a little bit more about footy. But um, yeah, generally, I suppose, well, well, actually, first of all, I'll say the the New Year's podcast here on True Footy has been a tradition pretty much since we started. There might've been one or two that we missed, but uh, I think the fourth ever podcast we did was uh, a New Year's podcast. And then Bush and I had a little bit of a tradition of it, um, you know, throughout the time I lived here over in Perth. So now that I live in the UK, I thought I'd do my best to keep the tradition alive. I don't know how long this podcast necessarily needs to go for, but, um, you know, I thought it'd be a bit fun to do it anyway. So uh, we'll get into the questions. The first one is from Kaylee Marie, who asks, how are you enjoying living in the UK? So I have answered this previously, so I won't repeat myself. So I'll think of it more, um, you know, broadly, but... I do love the UK, um, and I still I still feel very at home here, which is nice. Um, I feel very comfortable, and I really don't feel like a um, an immigrant, if you want to call it that, or um, and uh, what is the term? Someone who's living here temporarily. Uh, yeah, I don't really feel like an outsider. I feel very natural here as well, like talking to people, even though the differences between me and the average person here in Macclesfield is quite can be quite jarring, but at the same time. Um, I do find it very enjoyable living here and it's funny to, to contrast when I was here in the summer it was a little bit more party and, and fun vibes because I was kind of unemployed and I still hadn't blown a lot of my savings and I was making like four YouTube videos a week and um, and making a little bit of pocket money to cover a bit of the rent uh, but most of the time I was still going out and partying and traveling and stuff like that whereas since September since the final series basically when I got back from my last trip it's been very very much work 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 and uh, I am still loving that rhythm um, which is which is a nice way to finish the year because I've had some of the most fun I've ever had in my life this year and uh, this year was meant to be about trying to enjoy the last bit of my 20s and I absolutely nailed that um, I couldn't have had more fun than I possibly did um, this year and now towards the back end of the year, the, the focus has fl- flipped and I'm getting fulfillment in a completely different way through really throwing myself into YouTube at the moment. And um, at the moment, I've, I've never felt so good about True Footy. And it's hard to explain exactly why. Obviously, the channels is bigger than it's ever been, obviously. But in terms of the actual performance of the videos, they're not going great. Uh, that being said, I have to be patient because it is the depths of the off season right now Uh, we're right in the middle of it right so it should start in december 1st and then go till pretty much end of jan i reckon end of jan things start popping up again a little bit in terms of pre-season hype so i'm right in the middle of it right now and the videos are struggling a little bit but um at the same time i still feel really good about it and i suppose i'll elaborate that on that a little bit later but yeah, I love the UK. It's ridiculous because the sun goes down at 3.40. Uh, well, actually, uh, we're past the winter solstice now. What time is it? It is 3.41. Wow, that was weird. Uh, and the sun's just starting to go down. So uh, aside from that, I've gotten to the point where if it's six degrees outside, I'm like, ooh, this is nice. So I can drop a layer. I don't need to. <laughs> it's actually kind of warm out. It is weird. I've turned the heating off and it's six degrees. It's kind of... I feel like I've acclimatized, but uh, yeah, it's good fun. I do love the town that I live in. Again, I feel like I'm repeating myself a little bit for other viewers and listeners, um, but uh, I do like the small town vibe. You know, the the local pub and the the nightclub we go to is like 30 seconds down down the road, which is, um, which is a nice little vibe. I don't go there that much anymore since, uh, since the YouTube really picked up, but at the same time, it's nice to have it there. I never feel too socially isolated, even though I, I do, I am rather, um, it's nice to know that it's always there, which is a bit of a contrast to Perth, where I felt like I didn't have those opportunities to socialize, which I've talked about previously. Um, but yeah, my day-to-day at the moment is very much wake up, YouTube, gym, YouTube, 
and then bed. <laughs> and I will have meals in there. But um, yeah, that's kind of my routine at the moment. I'm still really enjoying it. Got a question from Niasha now, which is asking about uh, my personal and New Year's resolutions. Uh, sorry, my personal New Year's resolutions and for the channel. So some good New Year's content. I'm glad someone asked this. I probably would have said it anyway in this video. But uh, look, so personal New Year's resolutions. These things are probably... Both of these two things are one and the same, to be honest, because that is my primary focus at the moment. The channel and my personal goals are, are very much aligned, right? So in terms of non-YouTube stuff, um, a few things I want to do this year is I want to travel again. I can't travel as much as I did last year because I cannot afford to do that again. That was a once in a lifetime year. Uh, that being said, I would still like to maybe just hit up a few of the same places that I really enjoyed. Um, I want to maybe do another Kentucky like in Greece or Spain or something like that um, or Croatia again like I'm fine going back to those places because uh, at the end of the day those places are just it's a beautiful country uh, so scenic both Croatia and Greece in particular there's heaps of tourists around you're all sort of in the same mindset which is nice and traveling with other people who are also there to have fun makes the world of difference. Um, so that's what I'll look like to do a couple of times this year and I'd like to go spend another month in America. And, and still work on True Footy while I'm there because I did that in April of this year as well. Um, so yeah, big year, big year. So personal news resolutions other than that. So I want to travel um, and I want to um, I want to keep up the gym. So I'm, I'm pleased to say that throughout all this hard work, I'm, I've been working really hard at the gym this year and uh, my body weight has fluctuated because I've been traveling and then working out and then traveling and then working out. But for the last three months, uh, I have just, I've been to the gym just about every day. I reckon I've had like two days off the gym in like n the last 90, maybe, uh, excluding maybe my trip to London actually, but it's not far off that. Um, so I'm, I'm feeling in really good shape at the moment. And the other thing is because I'm not making a lot of money at the moment, I've decided I need to go down from four meals a day to three meals a day, <laughs> um, which like historically I've always eaten four meals a day. I'm a very active guy. Um, you know, sometimes I'm pushing nearly 90 kilos. so. Um, that's what sustains me. But yeah, long story short, I've dropped a bit of weight as a result because I'm eating less. Um, but I, I feel like it's in a healthy way. I'm sitting around the 85 mark at the moment. So yeah, keep up the gym and fitness and stuff like that. And for the channel, it's funny you ask this. Um, I don't know if I did this because it's New Year's, but I actually wrote down for the first time almost like a business plan for True Footy the other day. Uh, yesterday, I spent. I decided to take a day off making videos about this New Year's resolution series, which... Uh, is getting very moderate interest, but that's all right. Um, and I decided, what well, you know, for as long as I've been doing True Footy, I've had so little time to actually consider it from a strategic point of view. It's very much like I, I, I can contrast myself to someone like, from what I understand, maybe Cade McDonald, uh, but even some of the top YouTubers in the world. And the way they talk about it, it's almost like running a business and their strategic aims. They, they map out what they want to achieve, how they're going to get there and then they execute in that strategy. And by contrast, I'm just kind of like throwing wet paper towels at the wall constantly and seeing which ones stick and then like trying to replicate that over and over again. So the for such a, I feel like I'm such an analytically minded guy and I'm very logical and I generally will approach everything as best as I can, I'm like a, I'm a preparer and then I'll go and try and execute on a strategy. It's amazing to think how much of a mad scramble True Footy has been for six years. Because maybe to some extent, I've always been a little bit in denial about how seriously I want to take it. Um, like I always had the idea that I wanted it to be a real thing, but there was always something stopping me like actually just opening up a Google Docs document and mapping out everything that I wanted to achieve. So I'm actually gonna get it up here in the background. Um, and I'll, I'll talk through a few of the things that I wanted to achieve in 2024. So I've just opened it up here and uh, it's called the True Footy Manifesto. I, I deliberately chose a cringy day, but I think that's kind of funny. So uh, first of all, like any business, I, I've started with a mission statement, which I actually didn't finish. So I'm not going to read that out. But the idea of considering True Footy and the way I want it to be perceived, because like I said, it has been a mixed bag. I've tried to be versatile, try to make lots of different kinds of content about... Um, AFL generally and seeing what sticks and what people like and what they respond to. And I think over time, I've just lost sight of exactly how I want this brand to be perceived. And I'm still working through that at the moment. So I don't have a, a formalized mission statement or anything like that, but I do believe that everything that I that comes after this particular plan that I have for True Footy must be aligned with how I want the channel to be perceived. And everything needs to be an off, offshoot of that. 
So for me, I like like I said, I've dabbled so much with different things with Drew Footy. When it started off, it was a bit more of a hang a hangout podcast where we talk about footy, um, and then it got really deeply analytical, and th- th- that started to get a little bit of popularity. And then I felt a little bit um, aligned in that lane. And I feel like 2021 was probably the one year where I got that mix right between fun. Uh, we we want to be the guys that you enjoy watching football with. We started doing live streams, or at least consistently live streams. Uh, the podcast had, um, well, the podcast have always been pretty analytical, but at the same time, there's a bit of humor in it. Just the Tips was a fun show, like for a while there. We kind of made it funny. I'd like to get back to that. Um, but since then, I think at different times, I've just felt myself falling into bad habits or, or sticking to one lane. So for instance, particularly this year and probably also true in previous years, I've probably just, just made content that I thought was going to do well in the algorithm too often. And I think it's it's really interesting to contrast the first half of this year and the second half of this year in the way my content has been perceived for a start, but also the enjoyment and fulfillment I get out of doing it. So when the season's on, like I do a lot of like footy tipping videos, I do my power rankings, I do my round review, and it's all very unemotional, just reviewing what's happened not a lot of fun in it. And as a result as well, because I'm making a lot of content that is divisive and I'm making predictions about teams and people are taking exception to the things I'm saying, the the, the reception of it is always a mixed bag. And I, I think over time doing that consistently and getting a mixed bag of feedback, not that I need validation all the time, but at the same time, I think I kind of just lost faith in the idea that my content was valued if that makes sense i mean the views were there to some extent not so much this year but in previous years like just the tips will get a lot of views but then i think i kind of started to trend into content that wasn't actually adding much to people's lives if that makes sense like it was just a footy tipping video that sort of peaked at people's curiosity enough to click on it see what i said either say nice tips or they'll say um oh you you're a (laughs) nuffy you know what i mean like Whereas, by contrast, pretty much since the trade period started and the draft content, I feel like I have so much more to offer in that space to, to particularly casual fans. That's one other thing that I've probably underrated. I think I've probably thought of my content as making content specifically for people like me who are in, like football lovers, diehards. Whereas I've probably really opened up my mind to, in the second half of this year to realize how many people actually probably watch True Footy because they're kind of invested in football but they also just want someone to kind of explain what's going on a little bit so considering the different types of customers to use a marketing term um it has also been very helpful i know i'm kind of rambling here but bottom line is like i think one of the biggest lessons i learned from this year is probably to just get back to making the content that i feel good about uh, rather than just trying to growth hack and all the time and grow my channel consistently, I think balancing a lot, that a lot better next year will be will serve me in good stead and make it fun again. And that's why I'm enjoying the content now because it's content that I like doing. Trade, draft, I'm not really pissing people off. Not that I really care too much. Obviously, you have to accept a little bit of criticism to, to make it anywhere. Uh, but at the same time, like if there's constant friction between me and the audience, I think that has a detrimental effect over time. But yeah, so I think playing to my strengths, I think that's why maybe the Eagles corner was so well received this year. Um, this was, yeah, easily the, the year I've done the most Eagles content. And I know that some of the views banked because the Eagles were so bad, but at the same time, I made content that was very easy for me and also I felt pretty much like I could back up anything I was saying in that video, even if obviously people agreed, or di- sorry, even if people disagreed. Um, I felt somewhat confident in the content I was making whereas sometimes you phone it in a little bit when you're making round reviews for some games that I didn't watch so I'm going to change the format next year and probably make it a little bit more funny but anyway one other thing that I did was write down what are the values of this podcast and it sounds really cheesy and I I think this is actually something I got from Bunnings Um, but it's, it's also something that I think is going to be really important so I wrote down the following core values for True Footy going forward integrity honesty education, intellectual agility, fun, and innovation. <laughs> Some of those are genuinely from Bunnings Melbourne, <laughs> but they do apply to True Footy. So integrity, uh, do I feel like I am um, being honest with the content? I suppose that's also honesty, but um, 
I suppose integrity, okay, a better way to put this is maybe not chasing like clickbait titles in the way that Kane Corns does, um, for instance, and just actually speaking what my actual opinion is. I, th- I think to be fair, not to pat myself on the back, but I do think this is something I do naturally anyway, which I think is why in pockets, some people who have appreciated the content because it's a little bit different. Some like, uh, The Peter Sumich example is a classic example to demonstrate what I'm talking about of um, him talking about Sumich the other day. Uh, talking about Simo the other day. Uh, so that kind of ties in with honesty, saying what your actual opinion is. This is why I don't really like, this is always why I laugh as well when people think that I am biased towards or against certain teams because I hate them. Like, yeah, that's so not true. Anyway, uh, just speaking what my actual opinion is far more valuable than necessarily just feeding into this Eagles Dockers, um, you know, rivalry. Like I don't care. Like if I was literally talking to a Dockers fan, right? And we're talking about football and all of his opinions were like, yeah, now the Eagles are shit and everything was just negative about West Coast, I would just think, okay, you're not actually giving me your real opinion here and I'm not interested in hearing what you think about topics anymore. That's That sounds like an exaggerated version of my actual interactions with people, but it's kind of true. If somebody just says, nah, um, Ruben Jinby shit, bro, I'm just like, okay, I, I don't really care what you have to say because I don't think you're telling me what you really think. And that's the exact inverse of what I try to do on True Footy. Intellectual agility is about not getting too rigid in my opinions and being open to, to fle- being flexible and being proven wrong. Again, I think I've kind of already to do this with um, not to pat myself on the back, but I'm just, I think writing down these values is really important. Same thing with education. And that's probably where I can probably make informative content for people. Fun is something I need to get back to because I've really noticed this when I started doing live streams again this year, that um, how much I kind of missed actually just having fun with people online and talking to some cool people and they're they're not popular at the moment I'm doing BBL live streams but you just come in and we talk a little bit about the game we talk a little bit about Star Wars we'll talk about I don't know politics whatever all these little things that come up and I kind of want to get back to that Um, in particular I think adding a bit more of a comedic edge to what we do not I don't want it to be like a complete joke of a video or, or video series or anything like that next year I'm thinking of ways to make my content a little bit more entertaining but I, one thing that occurred to me was I was kind of watching back old videos and I was like, I probably went like 60 videos in a row without cracking a smile. <laughs> uh, not because I wasn't having fun. I like doing what I do, but I like, I kind of, it, it's interesting to, to look at the way my, my, some people might perceive me. And I do come across as a very serious guy, whereas I think most people would say that know me personally, I'm probably one of the silliest people they've ever met. Um, so just bringing that balance to true footy, I want, I want, f- uh, f- watching football and talking about football to be fun. And I think that's something I've trended away from a little bit and innovation is de- and development is, is about constantly being assertive around trying to find ways to improve the channel. That's basically it. Uh, because I do think I've lacked in that. So now that I've written those down, everything else that are my goals for, for going forward has to be in line with these values and I might change the values. Uh, because I only just whipped them up off the top of my head yesterday, but um, I'm pretty into that. The next thing I did was just like map out new, like numerically exactly how this year went from a performance st- standpoint and set some goals. So I gained about 6,000 subscribers this year. I'm going to set the goal of making that 10,000 next year. And my um, total views was 1.4 mil uh, this year, and I want to make that 2 mil. So everything everything from now on has to be aligned with trying to achieve that. And I, this is real nerdy and this is how like analytical I get, which probably doesn't shock you because of how nerdy this channel is. But, um, I, I have a spreadsheet for every single month of performance. This truth, this channel has ever done and it's views, subscribers, revenue. And what I didn't for next year is I forecasted exactly what I need to make each month to, to hit the goal of 2 million views in a year. And, but also like tweak percentages based on previous performance. Uh, so it's not just like, uh, I think it's 160,000 views a month. Obviously I can't do that in January, but in October I'm, I could potentially get 300,000. So in January I have to get like 60,000 views and I'm on track if that makes sense. So this is the first time I've ever really done in-depth goal setting like that. And I think it's really important because then you align all of your behaviors. This is probably just an analogy for life. I don't really know what I'm talking about this. Yeah, I'm just kind of into it at the moment. So I also wrote down some key learnings from 2023. This is not your question at all, Niasha. I'm sorry. I just, this is what's on my mind. Why not? Uh, so the key learnings play to my strengths with respect to my content, lean into what I'm good at and less 
less focus on trying to just get videos that will grow the channel, but I do need to do both. And I'm sure you understand why. Create content with the vision and brand in line. Too often I would chase views at the detriment of how my channel would be perceived. That's like I said, like anyone who discovered my channel in the first six months of this year was probably just like, I don't really care. Um, I don't really care that this guy's doing footy tips every week. Um, so I need to get back to what I'm good at. Invest more heavily in off YouTube channels to reach a new audience and diversify the brand. So that's simply put like, so first of all, shout out uh, friend of the channel, Alex Holmes. Uh, this guy's helping me out from a marketing standpoint of how to grow the channel. So you might see a few more sponsored ads on Facebook, maybe if you use Facebook, um, than you used to. And uh, big shout out to Alex, be love. He's really helping me out. But when we had the chat, we did a Zoom call about like, sort of like, I think vaguely, I'm gonna paraphrase the conversation, but something along the lines of like, what are you doing currently? What have you done previously? And I was kind of embarrassed about how little I had invested into doing things outside of YouTube. So. Instagram, YouTube, uh, sorry, Instagram, even YouTube Reels to some extent and TikTok, like I'm just non-existent until recently. You probably noticed it's kind of exploding right now. Um, but that that's another big focus for me and just reformat a few bits of content. So next year I have goals and I think this is really important for everyone to have goals because I think writing them down, psych you psychologically align yourself with them and then subconsciously you start to recognize opportunities that will help you perceive the goal. It's all one thing. It's one thing to do it, to just write it down at the start of the year and be like, eh, whatever. Like, I'd like to go to the gym more. It, it doesn't really have the same effect. So to really map out how you're gonna get there, I think is really helpful. At least that's the way my brain works. So yeah, I've kind of just rambled on about exactly what my resolutions are. It's going to be growing this channel, traveling, so I'm hoping this is like new new mindset that I have towards True Footy in a very strategic way, treating it like a business and and elevating it to where I think it has the potential to go and pivoting in that direction like subtly, I think is uh, is going to have some benefits. So that's where my head's at right now. That's uh, those are my resolutions for next year. Even though they weren't strictly resolutions, I just have goals that I'm trying to hit, alongside obviously some life enjoyment stuff, um, which is great. But thank you for the question, Yasha, and shout out to you. I love having you around the live streams and stuff. You've been around for a while. I appreciate you, mate. The CEO of Freedom, another name I recognize from the live streams, shout out, has the next question. What advice would you give to aspiring YouTubers? This is a uh, good question. And, and to be honest, for the most part, I do feel a little bit unqualified to give advice because I still feel like I haven't achieved uh, it. I won't say I haven't achieved anything. That would be silly. I, just, I certainly haven't made it. So, and I've just talked about how much like I don't do well in this video. However, I, I can give you some advice for someone starting out, whether it's an AFL channel or not. So the first thing you need to do, the first thing you need to understand about YouTube is that when you start making videos for the very first time, all that's happening with YouTube from an algorithm point of view is they're trying to work out who to show your videos to. And you need to bear that in mind big time. So you need to give YouTube so much of, uh, evidence as to what sort of content you are making and the sort of person who is likely to watch it. Cause that's what it does. It puts out your first few videos and it kind of dabbles and it, it sort of downloads like the demographics of the video, which sort of people like what age bracket are they? What gender are they? What other things do they like to watch? So you need to make it really concise and aligned all, all of your early videos and YouTube needs to have a really clear idea of what, of, um, of who to put your video to and what your video is about. So titles and thumbnails are so important, particularly titles and, and consider the keywords. Tags don't use mean as much as they used to, but titles and thumbnails are everything. And this is the next point I'll make, which is super important. And I, I learned this from Will Annie. He said it like offhand in a podcast once and it stuck with me, but it's so true. And that is generally, you need to make your title and thumbnail before the video, which sounds weird because sometimes you make a video, it might be a creative piece, you might just be, talking and expressing yourself and then at the end you're like what do I have to call this video you got to reverse you got to reverse engineer it you got to you got to do the title and the thumbnail and that that would just inv involve observing what does well so yeah you, you want your title to be catchy i mean you don't have to use real clickbait stuff but it needs to be like have some keywords in it like um success how to make money or something like that something that's uh really obvious to youtube what your video is about uh, this, the next point I put is don't underutilize clips, particularly YouTube shorts. I've noticed that in my analytics, I think this week, which has not been a strong week by any stretch, was probably my, one of my weakest weeks in terms of views and performance this year. 
that by using clips and, and YouTube shorts for the first time, 1,400 new people who had never seen a true footy video watched a true video, uh, video or watched a clip rather. So that tells you everything you need to know about how useful it is just for the brand awareness point of view. Now, 1,000 people, 1,400 people discover my channel and, and probably, I don't even know how many subscribers I got this week, probably like 50. Um, so the conversions there is not great, but at the same time, I wouldn't underutilize that sort of stuff. YouTube likes consistency, regularly uploading, brainstorming ideas and sticking to a schedule is a good idea. That's what I do. I have a, I have a big document of, uh, of all my ideas and then I, I keep myself accountable. I need to make this amount of videos in this amount of time um, and just research what works. So I don't want to ramble on because like not everyone will uh, find that part of the video interesting, but I hope that is helpful to you, mate. So the next part of the podcast, we'll, we'll talk into a, a few more footy questions. So some pretty random footy questions. Why not? It's New Year's Day for you guys. Um, so we'll just have a bit of fun. Leo King, shout out, a member of the channel. Um, I think my first member, actually. No, second member. Thank you, Leo. Uh, whose retirement other than Luke should we hurt the most? Uh, I presume you mean from a personal and emotional point of view rather than the team. But the answer is probably the same. I think as Nick Nat, I think especially with the the sense of not knowing when the end was coming. Um, it was a bit of a surprise, a little bit of a surprise when he retired. So yeah, there's a sadness there. I actually watched one of my old videos um, and there is a reason to this. It's not just um, arrogance. I have um, I have been thinking of ways to make new content coming up. So if you've made it this far in the podcast, I can give you a little tidbit. I've got a couple of ideas to make videos differently coming up. Hopefully that will be up in the next fortnight. That will be very different to what I've been putting out lately. Um, and I'm excited by it. And I don't necessarily mean you should be excited about it, but I do think it, hopefully it will be a much higher standard that people will watch and go, oh yeah, he used to he used to do videos like that and they were good. So anyway, I was watching the Nat Nui one, which is probably given away sort of some of it. But I, it's a video called, uh, put some respect on Nick Nat Nui's name and I watched it and I watched his highlights and I was like, oh my God, I miss having this guy in the team. So that's probably it. LOHT369 asks, your top 10 best Subiaco oval moments. I am going to rattle these off. It's almost a video in itself, but I will keep this short and uh, it's fun. It's a good good question. These are in no particular order. Um, Nat Nui's mark uh, and goal after the siren against North Melbourne 2013. Nat Nui's second game at AFL level where he kicked three goals in a quarter uh, against Hawthorne in the pouring rain and we won an upset win. Uh, I think this probably, the next one is my favorite and that was the last game there against the Adelaide Crows where we needed to win by like 21 points or something to make finals and we won by 24 and Lewis Jetta kicked a late goal. I think that, that's got to be the one. Um, 2011 semi-final against Carlton. 2011, if you're old enough uh, to have been like, con- like really conscious as an Eagles fan then, that was one of the funnest seasons ever because we'd won the Wooden Spoon the year before and, and the way we came out of the blocks that year was just unreal. Um, so I have a good, couple of good memories from that. Beating Carlton in the semi-final, we kind of had a little rivalry with them. Who was the genuine fourth best team in the comp? And obviously it turned out to be us. We beat them in a final and that was such a happy win for me. 2011 as well, earlier that year, we played Geelong in a home and away game. And that was again, I think we'd beaten Carlton the week before at Marvel. Uh, yeah, what is now called Marvel. And then we played Geelong, obviously. Uh, well, they won the premiership that year. They were one of the, yeah, the team to beat, obviously. Uh, along with Collingwood, but we we beat them by about 16 points, I want to say, uh, in like round 13 of that season. And I just remember the reaction on the siren was like, oh my God, these boys are legit. Obviously, we got smacked by them in the prelim, but th- that was just such a sick moment. Um, 2009, showing my age here, uh, to some of you anyway. Um, 2009, Tom Swift's Three round low vote game. I think it was the last game of the year. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was the last game of the year. And we smoked Richmond and we looked like we were going to... We trained, We won four of our last five that year and, and we looked like we were going to take the competition by storm the next year. Ultimately won the wooden spoon <laughs> the following season. But either way, that was a great game. I re-watched that so much. Uh, 2015 qualifying final against Hawthorne. That's got to be up there. Um, where we beat them and I remember saying we're the best team in the league. We are, we're going to win the flag got absolutely clapped in the grand final uh, a few other ones um, the Cousins return game in 2007 I do remember that quite vividly I think he had like 38 disposals the comeback in 2006 against Carlton now I didn't watch this game but I heard about it I was uh, on holiday in Paris as a child uh, We, but I did watch the Geelong game the week before where we 
won from nine goals down, but to beat Carlton from 44 points down the following week is pretty crazy. And the, the 10th one, because I couldn't really think of one, was Hayden Ballantyne's miss in a derby. Now, I actually don't th- reflect back on that that fondly because that was a tough game to watch. And I remember we kind of conceded like three late goals to almost lose that game. So there was relief, but it wasn't pure ecstasy as such. But those are some of my favorites. But let me know in the comments any others that you can think of. Harley Sports Talk says, uh, would love us to see a players under pressure list. Done one myself. Interested to see how it stacks up. Shout out, Harley. Uh, I will make maybe a separate video if you're interested uh, in doing that. Um, I think of, I think the f- first way I'd go about it is to go through the out of contract list as well, but I'm sure there's a bit more nuance to it than that. Spin Doctor. Shout out, Spin Doctor. Big supporter of the channel. Now, it's a big question, so I'll try and paraphrase. Uh, maybe, or I'll just read it. Uh, spin, spinny, spin dog. I call you spin dog in my head. I don't know why. I would like your thoughts on whether AFL rules, despite their insistence that they are protecting the head, uh, are actually having the opposite effect. They went a small way to addressing players ducking and dropping their bodies into tackles last year. Only about a decade too late, he says. Now they are going overboard on so-called dangerous tackles. This is incentivizing, incentivizing players to not to not, uh, not only not protect themselves in tackles, but some are deliberately flinging their head at the ground when tackled to attempt to gain freeze. Have I noticed that? And general thoughts on that and any other umpiring or interpretation issues? Good question. Now, I, I don't want to disappoint you with this answer, but I feel like this this area, uh, as well as like tribunal stuff, is a real weak point for me. For some reason, I just don't really get too invested in it. Um, it probably will only bother me if it happens in an Eagles game, to be honest. I haven't specifically noticed players fl- are like flicking their head to the ground, to be honest, but I'll trust your judgment on that. I suppose from a legislating point of view, in terms of establishing the rules, I think obviously it's better to have them in place than not. And I suppose overall, like if players are putting themselves in danger in order to seek free kicks, I kind of just think, well, that's kind of natural selection, isn't it? (laughs) Like, I don't know how you protect that. I don't know how you go against that other than to give umpire the license to not pay those free kicks when they believe that there's... um, there's foul play there. So another in a um, similar sort of situation is when players used to duck for free kick. Well, used to, they still do. Um, duck into free kicks. And I know West Coast in particular in 2012 was renowned for this. Um, but I kind of just think like, sure, give the umpire the license to say, hey, mate, you ducked into that, no free kick. Although just accepting the fact that they can't always get that right, it's hard. Uh, but also like if we're getting to a point where players are putting themselves in danger to chase free kicks, then that is obviously not going to be sustainable. And that will, the, the disincentives for that will naturally play out if that makes sense. So I don't know if they can do much from a rule point of view, but I think going back to a time where free kicks weren't paid for some of the actions that do happen, like dangerous tackles, is, uh, is, is a worse outcome. So I think it's, it's best now, the way we have it, where the rules are in place and players are probably trying to hack the rules in their own way like you allude to they're, they're trying for free kicks but that's probably the the only way it's ever going to work to be honest if that makes sense you can't really perfect the rules any better than that if that makes sense i, I know i'm rambling i am hung over i'm sorry I, I suppose what the annoying thing about this is that if we if we open these things up to umpire interpretation as we see with like deliberate out of bounds like that that is a mess um if we open it too much to interpretation, the frustrating part comes from when we feel like there's inconsistencies with the way that's interpreted. Um, there's absolutely no doubt about that. I just don't know how you fix that from a legislative, and when I say legislative, I mean the, the rulemaking part of it. Like, I don't know how you make it more objective rather than subjective. Like, it's frustrating when sometimes players clearly duck or they, you know, throw themselves to the ground and, and there's an inconsistent free kick paid, but... <sighs> The alternative of not having those rules in place, um, well, from a duty of care point of view as well, the AFL has got to consider that, but I also just think from a player wellbeing point of view, less players will get hurt doing that. Again, I'll, I'll say that I'm not super intelligent on this kind of stuff, um, but that was me just kind of spewing a bit of an answer, spin dog. A couple of quick questions to rattle this off. I know this has just been a long rambling podcast. Why not? Um, I've made enough footy content. We can just, I can just do whatever I want. <laughs> um, 
Bally0207 uh, asks, thoughts on the Batira brothers? That's an interesting question. And I don't know whether you mean from a playing point of view or their personalities, because I do, I don't really have an opinion myself on that. I just know that they're kind of known for having big personalities, particularly Peter. Uh, but my personal perception of the Matera brothers, I caught the back end. I caught the gross. I caught I caught the end of Peter Matera's career, like the last season he played as an Eagle. He it was 2002. That was the first year I, I had of watching football, and I didn't really have an appreciation for how good he was, other than being told he was a good player. And weirdly enough, he retired. I think in round one of 2003. I think we we played Port, and I actually don't remember if we won or lost that game. I feel like we lost to Port a lot back then, but I, I think we might have won it. Either way, I remember it was about 50 points, but I just can't remember if we won or lost it. But it's weird he had a farewell game in the first round of the season. Like, that would never happen now. These list spots are too precious. Um, so, yeah, Peter, that was my memory of Peter. That's pretty much it, just his farewell game. Uh, but Phil, obviously, was a good small forward throughout that... I think he retired in 2005. Did he miss the 05 grand final? Something like that. I'm pretty sure he wasn't on the list in 06, which is unfortunate because he missed out on being a premiership player probably. But yeah, he was a gun small forward. Um, I don't know. If, I can't actually remember if he was considered elite, um, but I think his, his output, like he kicked a lot of goals from memory. Aussie Aquatic asks, if North Melbourne improves in 2024, will Nick Larkey kick 100 goals? This one's pretty easy to just say no <laughs> because very few people kick 100 goals that hasn't happened in 15 years and it's I don't I don't know if I see that I think North what will happen with North is if, as they improve part of improving will hopefully be finding some other avenues to go so I don't think that's necessarily a given but uh, I get where you're saying you extrapolate what Nick Larkey achieved this year in a, in a poor team is outstanding and yeah naturally you can extrapolate that but that we know football doesn't work that way so I wouldn't bet on it if anyone's going to kick 100 goals they're going to be Charlie Curno of, of this modern era of, of key forwards I think he kicked 80 or something either this year or last year that's an outstanding effort so those are all the questions guys um, I realise that, that there hasn't been a lot of flow to this podcast it's kind of just been a bit of fun um, but one thing you can be sure about is I'm going to get a lot cleaner and decisive with the content that I make from now on and um, hopefully it will be better and I would also like to grow this podcast a little bit more it's, it's kind of been an afterthought this year it was more of a focus it's funny to think like when i started this podcast it, it was a podcast that was it uh, i started supplementing with other content and the channels just evolved from there but i would like to get this back to being a really cool product and and specifically i've got some guests in mind because i feel like some of the pods i've done this year particularly even with the ones with drews like i actually do think we in again i don't want to self self-congratulate here but i i relatively speaking when I watch the pods I do with Drew's about general stuff I think I think there's some value in that and I think there's potential there so to to um, take that format and apply it to, to getting more guests on the channel I've, part of my like manifesto thing yes I just burped is that I wrote down like 12 people I want to get on the podcast this year maybe once a month I get a guest on it but I also want to grow the the audio following. I think there's only about 200 people that listen to Spotify uh, regularly or they follow me on Spotify and only about 93 average listens. Um, so it just doesn't perform well compared to YouTube. Um, so I don't know how many of you know that this is on Spotify as well. Um, and some of you prefer to consume it on YouTube and some of you prefer it to audio only. So fair enough. Do you want. But if you could do me a favor and if you if you could rate it on Spotify, like five stars or whatever you think is fair, that would go a long way to helping me. I would, I would really appreciate that. And, and I think that's part of the goal that I have as well is building the audio side of this as well. Because there are some, and I mean many, uh, YouTube podcasts that like are way bigger in terms of audio listeners than, um, than their YouTube viewing. And uh, I want to tap into that potential a little bit. I have to earn it. I realize that. But if you do enjoy this podcast, I would appreciate it if you just rate it because uh, that would really help. But yeah, to sum up, um, this year has been unbelievable. Like it, it's, it's a cliche to say, oh, what a year, what a year it's been. But this year has been like no other for the rest of my life. Like, And, and might, might not have a year like this again. Um, I'll try and replicate it to, to, to a small extent next year. But the balance between life enjoyment and YouTube will be more slanted towards building this as my career that being said i do enjoy it so it still is life enjoyment 
Uh, but it's been, a, it's been a fantastic year and I do really appreciate all the support. Again, something I say ad nauseum, but I do sincerely mean it every time. And I do kind of, I've kind of got this belief now, this, this intrinsic belief, and I don't know if this is valid or not, but I kind of feel like people who watch and support the channel in the way that they do, I feel like it's probably not because they love True Footy in the current product of what it is. Because in a long way, in a lot of ways, this channel's regressed, certainly in terms of audio production, or audio visual production, um, and in general content quality. Other than what I'm saying, the other stuff around that I think has regressed. Um, so what I'm saying is I feel like there's a sense that people get around this channel, not because of what it is right now as the product that it is, but I think there's a belief in what it can become and that won't just necessarily be me and it's going to be a platform with, with other contributors and um, a better viewing experience. And I, I think that people see the potential of where it could be and I think that's where the faith comes from and I really appreciate all the support. And now I'm more aligned than ever with trying to get it to become what people believe it could be. So again, just rambling, but it's been an unreal year. So let me know guys, uh, let me know in the comments any personal resolutions you guys have, you guys have as well. Um, that would be interesting. It's, uh, it's a good thing to, to do as long as you kind of try and stick to it because what you want to do is in 12 months from now, look back at it and be like, yeah, I either achieved that or I worked really hard to, to get close to it. Um, and it can change your perception sometimes as well. I remember back in 2020, feeling like the 2020 year on YouTube was really bad, but that was because 2019 was really good. And then I think I thought back to some of the resolutions I'd said in the previous podcast, and I'd actually ticked a lot of them off, um, specifically a sponsor and stuff like that. Uh, so my point there being like, sometimes your perception of how things are going, when you compare it to objective things, like comparing it against your goals at the start of the year, sometimes you're going better than you, can go up, than you think you are. So I think, I think that's really good advice. And you know what? I've got some cool things cooking for you guys. Uh, like I said, I've got new ideas for content, um, better better ideas for content, but also a few off-field things to use the football term. Uh, obviously, it's all off-field, but a few business things um, that I'm really excited about and really can't wait to share with you guys. And hopefully over the next fortnight or so, that will all play out. And uh, I'm excited. I really am. It's, uh, it's going well. I've, I've aligned myself with trying to build this into what it can be. And it's not there yet, um, but things are starting to click a little bit. And I've, I'm really grateful for you all. So thank you very much for watching, guys. Thank you for indulging. Uh, this was me just talking shit. This was arguably my worst ever podcast, but I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.